Are you curious to learn more about Bordeaux wine? Would you love to know about its secret underground history? And how about overlooked vintages or regions where you can find some superb values? Uh, we always perceive Bordeaux as very expensive, but that's not true in all cases. So if you have just uh, joined me on the replay, please in the comments, type the word replay. And what's your favorite Bordeaux wine? Um, if you're here with me live, of course, please uh, join in the comments as well. Tell me about your favorite Bordeaux wine. Uh, what's in your glass tonight? What's the weather like? Where are you logging in from? I'm Natalie McLean, your host, and I offer North America's most popular online food and wine pairing classes. And you've just joined one of the most passionate groups on the internet uh, about wine. And we gather here every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine. So I am live streaming this video for the first time. We are simultaneously streaming on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And this is from a recorded conversation uh, that I did with my guest, Jane Anson, whom I'll introduce in a moment. And it was for my podcast, Unreserved Wine Talk. So we're going to, I'm going to be jumping into the comments during this uh, watch party, live broadcast, and answering your questions. So I want to hear from you. Uh, what are your favorite takeaways uh, and tips? What questions haven't we answered? Um, just tell me uh, your thoughts and impressions as we go on. Now, let me say, before I fully introduce Jane, one of you is going to win a copy, a signed copy of her gorgeous new book called Inside Bordeaux. And I'm going to show you pictures of that later. Uh, Jane probably has it with her. Oh, there you go. Good, Jane. Excellent. We're going to bring that up again, too, because this is a gorgeous tome and we're going to get into it. But what you need to do to qualify to win is to post a story or a post on Instagram or Facebook and use the hashtag Inside Bordeaux and Nat DeCants. Tag me, tag Jane, and tag her exclusive distributor in Canada, the wine agency All the Right all the right grapes. Now I'm going to post all of this in the comments so you just can copy and paste. And what we want you to do is tell us about your favorite Bordeaux wine or the wine, the Bordeaux you've discovered recently. We want to see what does that wine mean to you? What would you suggest as food pairings? Doesn't have to be technical, but uh, we want to hear from you. And based on those of you who enter, I'll be picking one winner and announcing that next Wednesday. So you're gonna to wanna to participate in that because this is just a gorgeous book. All right, back to our guest. So Jane Anson is the world's foremost authority on Bordeaux. She's actually lived in Bordeaux since 2003 and is the author of the newly published book I just mentioned, Inside Bordeaux, which has received so many glowing reviews and has been nominated for several writing awards. She's also the author of three other books, Club of Nine, Angelus, and Bordeaux Legends about the historic 1855 classification, which we're also gonna talk about. So she's also uh, the co-author or translator of more than a dozen uh, wine and travel books. So she is prolific. She's the contributing uh, columnist at Decanter Magazine on Bordeaux. And she's won several writing awards already, uh, include, including the Louis Roederer Wine Online Communicator of the Year for 2020, and the Born Digital, ugh, Born Digital <laughs> Best Editorial in 2020, most recently. She is a graduate of the Duid Tasting Diploma with the Bordeaux Institute of Enology and an accredited wine teacher at the Bordeaux Ecole de Vin. And she joins me now from her home in Bordeaux. Welcome, Jane. I'm so glad to see you and connect with you. Thanks so, so much for asking me, Natalie. I'm thrilled to be here. Ah, terrific. I can't wait for this, this chat. So we're going to dive right into it. But before we get right. to Bordeaux specifically, can you uh, tell me about the moment you realized that you wanted to be a writer. I have never not wanted to be a writer. The first book I wrote, I think I was seven years old. It was called The Beach Tree Patrol, which I just recently found in a trunk at home and had great fun reading it with my daughters, falling about laughing at how obviously seven year old it was. But it was- Was it a murder mystery or, or a um, thriller or detective? What was it was that? about a group of girl guides on a murder mystery. Yes, there was, there was a murder mystery coming into it. it, was, it was Your sense of adventure, even at seven. <laughs> exactly. I can definitely say that. Yeah, I have always wanted to be a writer. 
um, not necessarily about wine, obviously at seven, but but the thrill of, of publishing books is still for me the real, the, you know, really just I can't believe I get to do it now. Oh, wow. Take us to the moment, uh, take us to actually the worst moment of your writing career, if there's been one. Okay. Um, oh, there yeah. definitely has. Okay, so I don't often share this, but I'm going to share it with you guys, because it still makes my blood run cold 25 years later. Ooh. I was, so this was probably 1995 or 1996, so I would have been about 23. I was living and working in Hong Kong. And I had a job, it was like my first proper job, really a dream job. I was the assistant editor of a travel magazine out of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And we wrote about um, lots of different uh, kind of travel stuff to do with Asia primarily. And this particular article, I hadn't written because I was assistant editor, so I was editing it. And it went out onto Thai Airways in-flight magazine. So there were probably 100,000 copies maybe of this magazine that, that went out to all the airlines. And this particular article was about the Thai king. So the Thai king, who now has since, since died, he was um, called King Bumibol the Ninth, which is a 1X. I was editing and I put, I didn't notice, or maybe I'd written it, I can't remember now, but it said Bumibol X1, so 11 instead of 9. Oh. Now, for those of us, we would think that is not a big deal. But in Thailand, the king is basically a deity. Oh. And it was, um, it was, sacrilege it was I mean it was a seriously terrible thing that I hadn't noticed 1x instead of x1 and it had already been printed it was out on the airlines and they had to get every single copy of that magazine off the airline oh no and they had and they had six women with a black pen who had to go through and just manually cross out every single time <laughs> oh my gosh boom it for one x instead of x1 oh no just so, for transposing two yeah transposing what? two things oh so, my gosh i mean i still honestly makes my blood run cold talking <laughs> about it now <laughs> plus it certainly taught me the importance of checking 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 <laughs> yes wow. absolutely Brilliant. as a writer it's a, your worst nightmare just you know getting yeah. even just the little facts wrong but oh my gosh well thank you for sharing that with you you've You're come welcome. a long way since then jane we know so <laughs> let, let's end on a happy note not this conversation but what's been the best moment of your writing career to date gosh i'm there have really been so many I, as i said at the beginning i just i feel incredibly blessed and I really mean that to get to to write and to get to kind of earn a living through through writing I think probably looking back that one of the moments which meant the most was when I first convinced so you mentioned the books that I'd written the yes. very first real book that I wrote with my name on the cover was called okay. Bordeaux Legends and it was about the five first growths so the so Mouton, Lafitte, Latour, Aubryon and Margot and it was about how did they get to be the first growths and I, and I can remember clearly going to Chateau Margaux and the guy who was running it at the time, who was called Paul Pontel Pontellier, a wonderful, wonderful man, and asking him if I could write a book about mm -hmm. them. And it would, it would involve me following them for a year and getting to see their archives. And I knew I had to ask every, all five of the chateaus. So I picked the person who I felt the closest to and who I thought would probably you know, be the, the most welcoming to it. And he was amazingly open to it and said you know we trust you we've got nothing to hide so yes you can do it and that was probably 10 years ago mm. and that was the moment when I knew that I'd be able to write a book you know my first proper book that was that was mine and that it would be an interesting subject I can remember being terrified when he said yes because thinking <laughs> oh my god now I've really got to do it but that was probably one of the greatest days of my career of coming out from that chateau and thinking okay, this is going to happen. It's real. And did they give you unfettered access? Like, because they did, they did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it was wonderful. I, I got to go in, in all of the different chateau archives. And I would would spend a lot, you know, a lot of time, I basically followed them for a year, but also looked at the history. How did they write back 400 years ago? How did they become that such iconic chateaus as they are today? It wow. Was, it was a very, very special research process. Huh. Um, you know, it, it, it seems you're, you were destined to be a writer and of wine. Um, one of uh, my followers on social media, though, uh, asked this question. She, Lori wanted to know if you weren't writing, wh what else would you do professionally if you couldn't write? 
Okay, well, I would, I would say if I wasn't writing about wine, I would be writing about something else would be okay. one of the things I would say, because I think a lot of people who write about wine, probably it's wine that brought them to writing. I would yes. say for me, it's the other way around. It's writing that's brought me to wine. Yes. Um, in terms of if I wasn't doing that, I taught English for a year in Japan when I graduated. I loved doing that. I wouldn't mind teaching English literature, actually. I think that would be a, a really a fun and rewarding job to be a, a, yeah, a high school English literature teacher. A lot of the same skills. And you're right. I, I'm with you. Um, writing brought me to wine. Wine, to oh, me, really? for me, is my excuse. It's my hook. Um, it gave me the confidence to actually start publishing professionally, get paid for it. But uh, what I used to do is I, I was in marketing and high tech, and I would write these customer success stories. So it was all marketing oriented. But that was the aspect I liked most, um, you know, researching people's stories and bringing them to life. I just didn't have the confidence to be a writer, writer. So we share that. That's, that's, yeah, that's I like that. All right. So um, now what uh, you've you've really focused on Bordeaux so what what's been your most memorable experience drinking Bordeaux like what Bordeaux was it and where were you that um this is this is, is a tasting that happened about 18 months ago and I will always for the rest of my life whenever somebody asks me that question this will be the answer <laughs> guarantee <laughs> it it was at the Palace of um, Versailles in November oh. of 2019 and not knowing, obviously, that it would be the last time for goodness knows how long to have that kind of an evening where you wear a beautiful new dress that you've just bought and you're dressed up and there are a thousand people in the room, the kind of stuff that now it seems like a, another world that that ever happened. But anyway, it was it was a charity event at um, Chateau Versailles and it was um, held by Mouton Rothschild and mm. we tasted the 1945 Mouton Rothschild. Oh, the victory vintage. The, the victory vintage, the first vintage which had the, um, well, since the 1920s when they had the, the special label that was painted in, you know, in, in honor of the victory. And it's a, a wine which you've heard so much about, you've read so much about, and you can't even imagine that something can live up to the promise of, of a wine like that. But I can't tell you the frisson of excitement of all thousand people in that room when they brought in magnums of the 1945. Wow. And it was beautiful. It was still fresh and young. It tasted, I mean, young isn't the right word. You didn't need it to be young, but right. it was still fresh and complex and layered. And, you know, just, it was an amazing wine. And also just thinking what was happening at that time when that wine was made, particularly with Mouton Rothschild, they'd had their French nationality stripped of them during the war. Um, Baron Philippe had crossed the Pyrenees to get out of France. He'd kind of gone into England and then he was part of the D-Day landings. He wasn't the, June the 6th, he was about two or three weeks later, but he was part of that, of that D-Day landings coming into France, reclaiming Paris. And I mean, just, you know, the thought of all the history in that bottle, it was... <laughs> It was amazing. It was amazing. I love that story. And Versailles, the Sun King Palace. I mean, yeah. oh my gosh, I can imagine you in a long gown and glittering cool. and oh, oh my gosh, yeah. what a story. That's terrific. So, so what drew you, I mean, that's a magical moment, but what drew you to Bordeaux in the first place rather than say Burgundy or Champagne, other illustrious regions? I love that you picked those things because we okay. really, my husband and I um, were in London and we just had our first daughter. We have two girls. And we just had Lauren, who is now about to, well, she's now 17, 18 in the three months time. And um, we thought we would just go and spend a year in France. You know, I just had my first child. I thought, well, I'll take a year. Maybe I'll write a book. You know, the kind of dream that you think you have so much time when you have a new baby. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just quickly write a book. That's anyway, so cute. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we thought we would go to France and we did, we were exactly thinking that. We were thinking, should we go to Burgundy? Should we go to Champagne? Because we both knew that we wanted to get more involved in wine. Francis, my husband, was always a Bordeaux nut since he was a teenager. He'd always drunk a lot of Bordeaux and he'd, he'd been a few times and he'd read a lot about it. I was more Italian wine, really. I wasn't particularly that bothered about Bordeaux wine specifically, hmm. but I knew I wanted to write about wine. So we, so we were thinking exactly as you did, either Champagne, Burgundy or Bordeaux had to be one of those three in terms of ed editors wanting copy and it, and it working. And we decided Bordeaux was closer to England. So London to Bordeaux at the time, right up until um, COVID arrived, you could get three flights a day between Bordeaux and London at least. So you never felt very far away from home. Really, it felt like I could have been moving to 
Scotland or, or Cornwall or, you know, anywhere within, within the kind of easy access of my family. And the weather's nice. We're only two and a half hours from Spain here. And I knew that Bordeaux wine had such a great history and links with England that I just felt that there'd be something as a writer to, to kind of get to know here. That's but I true. Yeah, definitely that's say true. I didn't know enough to be scared. I think had I known that Bordeaux was you know, so illustrious in the world of wine and had so the, the people who were writing about it then, like Robert Parker or like um, Hugh Johnson or you know, all of these really venerable people, I think had I known that, I might have been too scared to do it. But luckily, <laughs> I, luckily I was too ignorant to, <laughs> to care. That's what we do with a lot of our, our life choices. It's like, thank goodness I didn't know all the implications because yes. I'd still be cowering in the corner or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you, that's fascinating that you mentioned the British connection because of course you're British and so... Bordeaux, um, I think, definitely has a stronger link with the British historically. Tell us about that. It's actually um, quite amazing when you start looking at the history of Bordeaux that a lot of the actual structure of how Bordeaux wine is sold, obviously not made, but how it's sold, really does date back to 1152 when this part of France became part of a, a, like a duchy, basically, of the English crown. And there was a woman called Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was French, who was um, kind of owned, or you know, this part of France belonged to her through her father. And she married, it was her second husband, but she married a guy who quickly after their marriage became Henry II of England. Oh, he actually was also choice. French. But okay. yeah, she did. And her first husband was the King of France. So she definitely, oh, she did pretty okay. well for herself. She had a good network, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so when, this, when they married, the whole of her lands, became almost like English soil. So if you made wine here and you sold it in London, you were paying no taxes. It was really an extension of the same market compared to if you were selling it in Paris, when you were crossing enemy land to get there, you were probably paying various taxes along the way. And it meant that the trade in Bordeaux focused outwards right from that time. It was a wine which was made locally, but was created with another outside market in mind in a way that most other wine regions never are, even today, and certainly weren't at that time. So today, Bordeaux wine is sold through this kind of slightly weird network of having the producer and then a broker and then a, a merchant. So you have like this three layer system, even within Bordeaux. And the reason that began was right back from when the English were here, because you had overseas merchants being the British speaking English, and then you had the local French people making the wine and you needed people in between the two to kind of do the trade. <laughs> and that's how the, this strange system of Bordeaux has grown up. So it is really fascinating that even though that, that continued for 300 years, but from you know, the mid 15th century, it's gone back to being French. And of course it's always French now, but that kind of remnant of the English time here is still part of the, part of the DNA. So it is very, very interesting for, for, from my point of view. Absolutely. And is that what they called the Place de Bordeaux, that so the system? Place, the Place de Bordeaux, yeah. The Place de Bordeaux is, it's a kind of virtual marketplace and it has grown out of that original system. Huh. Okay, because 70%, I think you've written, um, of Bordeaux wine is sold indirectly. There's not a direct connection between the buyers and the sellers. It's through that third party, the uh, the negociant, the merchants. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and was it the Bordeaux? I mean, you've also mentioned that 70% of wine in Bordeaux used to be white or sweet. So was it the British influence that cause the flip to the red, the claret? Oh, I love that question. Okay. So, so back in the, the, those 300 years when it was English, it was mainly red. They, the, the English okay. basically preferred red wine, drank more red wine still. I don't know if that's true today, actually. Maybe it's kind of even today. But the switch in Bordeaux came after the English left when the Dutch mm -hmm. came, because the Dutch have always been much more interested in, in white wine and brandy and, and all that kind of thing. So there was an awful lot of white wine produced. And right up until the 1970s, there was a little bit more white wine. So in 1970, it was more like 53, 47 or something like that. But then from 1972 or three, I can't remember the exact date now, um, it switched to red. And today Bordeaux is 90% red wine. So oh. it's really been a, a, big, a big switch. And I think one of the things I find interesting about that 
is that we tend to think of Bordeaux as being such a kind of traditional, unchanging region. But then just that one statistic tells you, in fact, like everywhere, Bordeaux is perfectly capable of changing and adapting to what consumers want. Oh, that's a great insight to draw from it. And the fact that they remain outward focused, um, you know, with an international that's focus. You're right. Yeah. That's a really good point. You're right. And in fact, it, it's kind of so interesting to see the effect, the impact on Bordeaux that all of these foreigners have had mm -hmm. over the years. Yes. And you've called the, the region a land of immigrants. So tell me about the impact that the Irish had there. Okay. So, so the Irish came a little later. So the English, we can think of like 12th to 15th century, and they had a lot to do with the structure. How is the wine sold? Mm -hmm. The Irish came a little later, like 17th, 18th century. So after the English left, you had the Dutch, you've had Germans, um, a lot of people from, from basically the Northern European countries. And then 17th, 18th century, you had a lot of Irish that ended up being up to a third of all of the the immigrants who were living in Bordeaux would have been Irish. Wow. And not just, the interesting thing is not just Catholic. Some were Protestant, some were Catholic. Um, again, and why, why were they coming to Bordeaux? Were they escaping well, sometimes something? They were, sometimes they were escaping from religious persecution. Okay. Sometimes it was, you know, we're close. We, 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 you know, we, keep, we mustn't forget just how close geographically this part of France is to England and Ireland. So it was pretty easy for them to get across the sea. And Bordeaux has always been a very successful port. There's always been money to be made here. So the Irish have throughout history, this incredible waves of immigration that have gone from Ireland to America, to Canada, to France, to, you know, to all over the world. That's been a really a feature of, of Irish history. Absolutely. My grandmother was a brophy, by the way. Ah, see, so mine too. So my great grand, my great grandmother and my great grandfather were both, one was from, um, Tipperary and the other from Kilkenny. So how, how about you? Well, um, I should know where she came from. See, I know more of my Scottish heritage because oh, I've nice. got Scottish on both sides. So, um, and of course I've watched uh, Braveheart. So I know all about the <laughs> history. My mom's doing a family tree. So I'm going to have to ask her, where did the Brophies come from? I should know that, but uh, I, I'm more up on the Scottish side. So well, how lovely to have Scottish and Irish. Yeah, well, very, very nice. it, people think it makes me an automatic, um, I don't know, have a Teflon liver or something. It's like, that's why you're writing about wine. It's <laughs> like, maybe, maybe that's true for both of us, from yeah. our Irish background. <laughs> So, yes, so, so, so the Irish were merchants, mainly, okay. they would come here, and they also bought chateaus, I mean, some of our most famous chateaus, today, Leoville Barton, ah. still owned by an Irish family, and in fact, the Bartons came in the 17th century, and they're one of the very few who have, if not the only, if I think about today, they're probably the only one to have survived every single problem along the way. So the French Revolution, they were here during the French Revolution. They had to transfer the ownership of their estate at the time to a friendly local, a, a business partner of theirs, so that it wasn't taken away and given to the state. But, um, but they survived the French Revolution and all, you know, both world wars. They were there at the 1855 um, classification. So they're really a fascinating family to think about the, the history of the Irish. But when you look at when there were a lot of Irish here, they were responsible for a lot of the, of the trading, but also a lot of the blending. Because I'm sure you know that part of the history of Bordeaux wine is today, everything is made at the chateau and blended at the chateau. But for a long time, it was the negociants who were responsible for blending the wine and aging it and then selling it on. And the Irish merchants were particularly known for mixing up different chateaus or different styles. And so if you look at old archives, you can see some of the Irish merchants taking maybe 50% of Bechevel, adding in 10% of Lafitte, putting in a little bit of wine from, um, from the Rhone Valley or, you know, just really mixing it up because they were, again, they were thinking about their end consumer and they were trying to find flavors that they thought their consumer would like. So it was much more kind of like making a branded wine today as opposed to trying to kind of keep the exact imprint of a specific chateau, which is how we think of fine wine today. Absolutely. And is that because they were all meeting at the pubs and talking and I horse trading? So. <laughs> I think there were, there's a little part of Bordeaux called Chartrand, a gorgeous, gorgeous part of the city that's right down on the riverfront. And that's where all the merchants were. So I <laughs> bet they, they will have been tasting each other's stuff and <laughs> checking out what worked. <laughs> <laughs> and what about now, you said this was a famous port, so lots of trade passing through. What about the slave trade? What, what impact did that have on Bordeaux? 
So Bordeaux was um, the, I think about 16%, so let's say between 15 and 20% of the whole slave um, ships of France went through Bordeaux at, at the height of, of, it was a little bit later to come in than places like Caen and Nantes, a few of the, of the other places started earlier, to the point that actually Colbert, who was um, the Minister of Finance, I guess, um, under Louis XIV, he had to, his, he, he came down to Bordeaux, I think he sent his son, and they were cross with the Bordelais merchants for not bothering to make their own ships, because Bordeaux had always been a port, they would be maybe Dutch ships who would be part of the slave trade and other ships that would come here. But the, but the French didn't own their own. The Bordelais didn't own their own to the point that Colbert came down and said, right, you need to get into this trade because there's money to be made here. So I, I think the year was 1682. I do have it somewhere, but I think uh, 1671. 1671, a local um, company was formed to, to do slave trades. <laughs> and it ended up that about 15 to 20 ships per year would leave Bordeaux and be part of this triangular trade. It's something which the chateaus do not talk about enough because honestly, quite a lot of them were involved, certainly a lot of the negotiants. And they may not have been actually sending out the, the um, slaving ships themselves, but they were benefiting from the trade. They were benefiting from the fact that this was such a lively port. And what would tend to happen is it would leave France and go to either the West Indies, who had an awful lot of, of stuff in the West Indies, this part of France, um, or to Africa, and then go over to the States and you have these wonderful big um, warehouses in Bordeaux along the riverfront, and they would have stored um, sugar or coffee or, or, or um, calico, you know, different materials, as well as wine. It was really, a, really was a very important um, center for all kinds of trading. And so you wouldn't really see the impact of slavery here specifically. Hmm. I think in the archives, you can, there were maybe 300 freed black slaves in a couple of years that I've looked at at the end of the 18th and the end of the 17th century. Um, but that doesn't mean they didn't benefit. And an awful lot of these gorgeous, gorgeous buildings that you see in Bordeaux are, are made on money, which is built off the slave trade. Wow. But I would say in the last decade, there has been more of a reckoning. They have now, there is a very, very good um, permanent exhibition at the Musée d'Aquitaine, so one of the big museums here, which is a permanent um, exhibition which looks at France's role in the slave trade. And that's really important. And you're starting to get that kind of thing. But I, I very much hope that Chateaus over the coming years will, will because it, you know, it's all, all never the same owners today, but I think it's still important to talk about the fact that this happened. Yes, absolutely. And were the slaves involved in building the chateau or building the buildings or no. it was just the profits that were yeah, used it was the to? Profits. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, so let's get to that 1855 classification. Um, do you think, uh, what were the pros and cons? And so it was Napoleon III, and he classified all of the, I guess it was 61 Bordeaux Chateau at the time into tiers of quality. So, you know, five first growths and so on. What do you think uh, are the pros and cons of that system today? Because it still remains very important. Okay, so... So if we take ourselves back to mid 19th century, we're about 50 years after the French Revolution. And after the French Revolution, most other countries in Europe wanted nothing to do with France. They were completely, because most countries were monarchies, of course, at the time. Mm. And the thought that France had dispensed with its own monarch in a rather abrupt manner did not um, kind of endear them to the other great trading nations around. So by the mid 19th century, you'd had various Napoleons in out, the monarchy being restored and then it had gone away again. And, and you, you, were taught, you were really in a sense of stability by 1855. And the French were really saying, we're open for business. We want to get back onto being a, seen as a, a partner for trade globally. And so this was seen as kind of the way to, to, to demonstrate that. Okay. And, um, and so everyone had to give show what, what they were best at and so obviously this this happened that Bordeaux came up with with this this wine ranking um there were four first growths at the time I mean, this is part of the, the the story of my that I kind of covered in 80 in my Bordeaux legends book it's only one chapter but I do look at the 1855 ranking and so you had four at that time mid 19th century and then a hundred years later Mouton Rothschild was promoted mm -hmm. to join them so right. part of the story I look at is 
just how unbelievably hard it was for Mouton to get that. It basically took them 50 years of lobbying five different agricultural ministers and just not giving up until finally somebody agreed to do it. Wow. Um, and anyway, so I would say it's probably the world's first culinary ranking, probably the first time in the world that anyone could look at a list of products, products, a consumable products and say, oh, OK, I get it. This one is better than that one. And it was simple. OK, and I would say I would say that's a lot of its power. The fact that there's even though obviously we know everybody knows really behind these things, it isn't simple. And because it hasn't changed since 1855, it is there are plenty of chateaus that have changed in terms of quality and maybe if we did it again today what position they would be in so that kind of thing could change but it, it won't i can guarantee you they will never redo 1855 um, because there's just too much invested in it as it stands and you don't need it to change i think today it's part history it's part um something to live up to so in the, in the 1970s, after World War II, a lot of these chateaus had absolutely no money and a lot of them nearly disappeared. So in the like, early 1970s, probably four or five estates that are in 1855, very, very nearly went completely out of existence because they had almost no vines left and they had no money to invest. Wow. But the fact that they were part of the 1855 system gave people something to live up to. And I think it was really a, a great reason why people might come in and buy that estate or a new family member might come along and think, you know what, there's something here. And so they reinvested and now they're you know, all back up to really fantastically high quality. Wow. So there's a there's a benefit for that. Um, I would say don't follow it slavishly, definitely. No. But, mm -hmm. but, I, but I think it has a value. Hmm. And did you come up with your own informal ranking system of Bordeaux? So for, for my latest book, for Inside Bordeaux, I have for each one, for the 1855 ranking and the JA ranking for, for these. So I did that. Sorry, the, what's the JA ranking? Sorry, Jane Anson ranking. Oh, I see. Sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah, nothing. <laughs> we'll all be familiar with that soon. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it is not a big part of the book for me, really okay. isn't. But I thought it would be a fun thing to, to do. I've only ever taken people down one. I've never gone, okay. I've never taken people out more than that because it, the point okay. is not to be cruel or the point is not anything other than to say, I sometimes think that these guys could maybe, um, you know, do do better, but but I've okay. more, I've more put people up that I feel like they really are truly making brilliant wine. So I can give a, an example of something yes. put up. Um, so Ponte Canet, Ponte Canet was a, with a fifth growth in 1855 okay. and I put it up to being a second growth in mm. my JA. So yeah, I'm totally happy to promote people more than one rang, row. Rang is French, franglais, sorry, <laughs> more than one row, but I don't put them down more than one. Did anybody make it up to the first first growth? I, yeah, I put, um, I think I put Lever Les Gas up from <sighs> second to first. Okay. And one other, oh, I think I put Palmer from third up to first. Oh, wow. So, yeah, That's so great. Somebody. They must be happy with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so um, then uh, do you think that um, sort of hierarchical structure of 1855, do you think it led or played a part in any way of the mindset of the, the craze for scoring wine, which is another way of ranking wines? Do you think the two are connected in any way? Yeah, I think... And I, I definitely think this is kind of a downside as well of this idea that it's simple. Um, here we can see this is one, two, three, four, five. And of course, it's the same thing with scores. It's very easy to say, oh, this 98 is much better than this 93. It seems simple. But actually, in just the same way as 1855, sometimes, okay, here we are, we're, um, what are we, Monday evening, I want to have, let's imagine I'm going to have a really simple supper tonight of, um, I don't know, tomato pasta or whatever. I would much rather have a 93 point wine with that than I would have a 98 point wine with that because I wouldn't be looking for big, powerful, impactful, going to take 20 years to age. I'd be looking for something which is smoother and easier and maybe more friendly and more approachable. So I think just that tiny thing tells you that it, it's never as simple as just following the points. It's always about what mood am I in? Who am I drinking it with, et cetera. Um, and if we think about the points out of 100, we haven't mentioned, I mentioned Robert Parker a bit earlier. Clearly, he's the person who is most associated with 100 point score. But I guess to be completely fair to Parker, when he started it, he was actually hoping to go against the 1855 
he was trying for it not to be such a straitjacket. And I think he was very much trying to say, it doesn't matter what they have on their label. I'm, I am um, bothered about how good is the wine and can I show consumers wines which are really over delivering and it doesn't matter if they're classified or not. So I think it started out probably with very noble intentions, but I definitely, I, I, for my own, I score wines because you know, you have to really, mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. really very difficult not to now, but I very strongly feel read the, read the notes rather than just mm. the scores. And for me, it, it's a snapshot in time. There are certain wines which do blow you away with how great they are. And it's cool to be able to say, oh my God, this is a 98 or this is a hundred, but it's only one tiny part of the, of the joy of wine. Absolutely. As I've always thought, you know, it's hard to trap a subjective experience into a number, but I tried to go without scores for the first three years that I wrote about wine. I just got so many emails going, come on, we don't want to spend more time on buying wine than we have to. It's like buying toothpaste. Just tell us if it's good or not and signal that simply in a score. So anyway, I caved. Um, yeah, no, but, I, I hear you. I hear you. I had exactly the same thing. But yeah. And, and how much influence did Robert Parker or does Robert Parker have on Bordeaux wine? What was it and what is it today, his influence? So, I, I mean, he was obviously in his heyday when I moved here in 2003. So he'd already been 20 years of, um, of being a very important, important part of Bordeaux. And there is absolutely no question that for a long time he had an enormous influence to the point that people, no matter what they say now, there was no doubt that there was a, at least a strong motivation to make your wine in such a way that he would have awarded um, good points. So you know, there's, there's just no question about that. And um, I would say over the last decade, it has really righted and gone back. And I mean, righted purely in the sense that I'm, I'm not trying to be anti-Parker. I mean, it, it, it's kind of stabilized and go back towards away from those high extracting wines, big, big, big alcohols, and more towards what is probably a more natural Bordeaux style, which is a slightly more balanced, slightly more elegant, because we are in an oceanic climate here. You know, we, we're, not, we're not like Napa where you can very naturally get to hugely high, big, overripe um, fruit notes. If you want that, you've got to really push it. So, so there's a lot of, um, you know, just a return, I would say, to a slightly more balanced style. And why is that? Why have they gone back to a balanced style? Well, I think because the Parker is, has his influence, has obviously he, he's now retired. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a general feel in the world of wine generally moving away from those big over extracted kind of flavors. I mean, it, it's such an interesting question. And I, I, I expect even if Parker was able, none of us are able to do this forever, but even if he was still doing um, what he did now, I'm sure he himself also would have evolved away from that style. Sometimes I wonder, is it because now we've got global warming, we have every year now, the question is not, can you get ripe enough? The question is, even here in Bordeaux, is can you control your sugars? Can you control your alcohol? All of those kind of things. So maybe it's not so clever anymore to push and get all of those extreme flavors. Maybe the skill of being a winemaker today is to kind of step back, take your foot off the pedal because we have the, the very real problem of summers being too hot and too dry. So yeah, I, I, I don't know, I, I guess it's a, it's a mix of lots of different things, but I mm -hmm. would definitely say there is a sensibility, a realization now of, of how to, yeah, take your foot off the pedal with winemaking. I like that metaphor. And you've mentioned uh, climate change. Um, so what has been the impact on Bordeaux with climate change that you've seen over the past, whatever, five, 10 years? I would say um, it's, it's interesting looking purely at the grape varieties. Obviously mm -hmm. here in Bordeaux, we're a blend of different varieties. So you have a little bit more um, leeway in terms of what you use and, and what percentage do you use. But when I moved here 20 years ago, there was a lot less Cabernet Franc and Putti Verdo than there are today. So, and even Malbec. So these kind of grapes, which are used in 5%, 10%, even 2% of a blend, they are now being used more and more because they give a bit of extra spice, a bit of extra acidity, slightly lower alcohol. 
Merlot is still hugely important in Bordeaux, but there is a realization that Merlot, more than any other grape, is at risk of going too far, of becoming you know, too right. big, too ripe, etc. So right. people are, are, are doing a lot to, yeah, to, to try and work with other grape varieties to help the blend. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of viticulture, there's changes. When I moved here, and again, I, it's, it's not fair. If I, it's, it, we just use the shortcut to say Parker style. I don't, it's not specifically him, but sure. what is certainly true that back in 2003, 2004, 2005, the people were stripping the leaves so that they'd expose the grapes entirely to the sun to get them as ripe as possible. Nowadays, you would cover the leaves as much as possible to try and shade them from the sun to keep those kind of fresh flavors and not make it too, too jammy or too high in sugar. So just little things like that. Um, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing those kind of changes. Huh, that's that's great. And that's good to know. Um, so when a lot of us think about Bordeaux, especially I think in North America, we think the Grand Chateau, we think really expensive wines out of reach. But why is that a really incomplete picture? Um, so those classified estates, the kind of, let's say, $30, $40 plus estates, only make up about probably not even 5% of the whole production here, but, but let's, let's imagine 5%. Um, there are between, there are about 6,500 chateaus in Bordeaux hmm. today. That's a lot less than when I came because um, a lot of guys are kind of amalgamating or they've sold up or whatever reason, but there's still, that's a lot of winemakers, 6,500. Yes. And I would say, yeah, really maybe 500 of them are the kind of people that we're talking about that we imagine with their grand chateaus, where they can sell for whatever price they want to, or certainly at an expensive price where they know that they are sustainable. They can employ somebody to do the marketing. They can have their first class seats on the plane and go off to, um, to do some wonderful tasting in New York, etc. But most estates here are like winemakers everywhere in the world. They are family run. They're um, doing it as best they can to hand on to the next generation or they're changing from a different um, career and they're doing something, they just have always wanted to be a winemaker, so they're just trying it out. You know, there are a lot of fun, interesting, small estates who are really pushing at the boundaries of, and that's one of the things that I really have tried to do in Inside Bordeaux in my latest book, is to give just as much respect and space to those guys as, as the classified estates. So I, if it, for all of them, I have tried to give a, you know, a page or whatever, in, enough time to say why this estate is interesting, who's running it today, not about the history so much as what's happening now. And I've done that just as much if it's a small Cote de Bly estate or Bly Cote de Bordeaux estate, or if it's a classified um, Chateau Margaux, because I think in each case, we as wine drinkers, it go right back to what we said at the beginning, both of us. It's the stories behind them that's so interesting. Mm, you know, why are absolutely. they making wine? What is it that's, that's just making them st um, stand out from other people? And what, what will you as a wine drinker, what can you tell your friend when you're opening this bottle? What's kind of cool? What's, what's, what's their, I don't know, what um, did they used to... There's one guy who, whose family make wine today, but he designed the Orangina bottle, you know, that very, very oh, famous kind of right. bulbous um, Orangina bottle in the 1950s. Okay. Anyway, so I mean, does he make orange thing. wine? I have to ask. <laughs> yeah, he should. Damn it. They're really missing a There's trick. There's an opportunity <laughs> there. There's an opportunity. <laughs> But you, you've got 800. Yeah, exactly. I love those tidbits. And you've got 800 chateaux in this. Um, that must have been a lot of, surely, surely you didn't have to visit 800 chateaux. Well, I visited a lot of them. What okay. I definitely didn't do was I didn't get somebody else to visit it for me. Okay. And tell me about it. So I either visited every single one myself or I had tasted every single one in some instances. So for example, like a La Lombe de Pomerol, which is a smaller appellation here that, that of course I knew, but I didn't know as well as I knew I had to know for writing this book. So I went to the local um, kind of wine, a, I can't remember what the word is, um, they're called Maison du Vin. So the local kind of wine body. And I said to them, can you set up a tasting for me? And so they would have set up maybe 50 different estates from there that I would then do a horizontal tasting of them all. And then the ones that I particularly thought were really interesting and brilliant, then I would go to visit them. So sometimes I would have a kind of 
a pairing out process before I got to the to the actual visit. But I definitely wrote an awful lot. I mean, I, it took three years of research, so that was a lot of visiting, and also wow. a lot of the estates. I mean, yeah, I, I visited a lot of estates that I hadn't visited before, even if I thought I knew them well. Or you know, the thing about Bordeaux is, it doesn't matter how long you're here, you never know everything in this place there's just so many goddamn estates <laughs> <laughs> and they keep increasing or, or amalgamating or whatever they won't stay <laughs> yeah. put for you exactly. but three years Damn that's it. a lot of work oh my goodness let's i'm going to screen share jane and let's look at this beautiful book you've got it there with you so you can hold it up um and then i'm going to get the screen share working here um oh it's so beautiful yeah. oh look yeah. at it 700 and pages and they, they have done a wonderful job, this gorgeous kind of gold leaf that's yes. so beautiful. Oh my gosh, okay. Let's see now. Um, there we go. And let's see if I can get this enlarged. There we are. Okay, can you see my screen? I can, yeah. Okay, so here it is. We were just looking at that. It's got some beautiful, what do they call these little ribbons? I guess they're bookmarks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> beautifully designed. Now you went through an unusual publishing process. Um, how did you find a publisher for this? So um, I, I you're, you're absolutely right. This is not a, it's not a publisher in the traditional sense of the word. This is through a, um, a wine publishers who it's a wine shop in England called Berry Brothers. Berry Brothers and Rudd are one of the kind of oldest and most venerable um, wine merchants in England. And they, over the last 10 years have paired with a brilliant, brilliant um, small pair of publishers um, who call um, Chris Folks and Carrie Seagrave, hmm. who for their career, they have been publishers of, of Hugh Johnson, of, of many of the great um, wine writers of England have, have worked with this, this couple previously. Wow. And when, when Berry Brothers decided they wanted to do a just a very small amount of high quality wine books. They went to Chris and Carrie and asked if they could start an, an imprint basically of, so it's, so it's separate to Berry Brothers. There was at no point was I told by Berry's include these estates, et cetera, mm. et cetera. It is a separate imprint, but it is, it, they're, they're the people behind it. And about, I guess now, maybe eight years ago, they did a book called Inside Burgundy. Inside Burgundy is um, written by Jasper Morris, um, mm. MW, and he wrote a, a brilliant, very in-depth guide to Burgundy. And so this Inside Bordeaux is kind of the companion piece to Inside Burgundy. Fantastic. And, and yeah, I, I had almost signed a contract to do a book about Bordeaux with somebody else. And it was a very happy meeting that I met Chris and Carrie at a time when they were basically saying, they were looking for somebody crazy enough to take on the project of doing inside Bordeaux, because you could not write this book if you didn't live here. Yes. And, and you couldn't write it if you weren't just prepared to work. So really, really hard. Insanely hard, hard yeah. It. And so well, luckily, when we met each other, it was the right time. And we both knew that the both sides knew that we would give it, be able to do it justice. And oh so, my gosh, was, so I was beautiful. So lucky to, to meet them. And I just want to remind those of you who are watching, one of you is going to get a personally signed copy of this gorgeous book. Uh, in Canada, the distributor is the wine agent, All the Right Grapes. So you can also purchase this book. Now, Jane, you have your distribution around the world is all very exclusive, like Sotheby's and so on. People can't just go to Amazon and get this book. No. And this that was a, a really important decision that was made because making this this kind of a, a book it is really a big investment in the terms of that's why I'm so lucky to have met a publishing house who was prepared to put in the time and the effort and the budget to make a book with these kind of maps and this kind of research yes. um you know we all know it's very it's, it's difficult to find publishers now who will who will be so patient so for example we thought initially this would be a two-year period of writing but it stretched to being three years and we thought that it might be 500 pages. It turned out to be 700 pages. And at every point they said, we want you to make the best book you can do. We, you know, do, do the work and we will find. I mean, they were just so, so great. Wow. But because of that, we made the decision not to sell through Amazon because Amazon takes such a, a large percentage that it, wouldn't, that it would have been difficult for the publisher to put all that investment in. 
and then not control the distribution. So, so the way we've chosen is that we're in 20 countries. It's been really wonderful. But for each country, we have um, a, a distributor. So, oh, wow. And so you've got the links. All the right grapes yeah. have been amazing. Oh, and good. All, all the right grapes. I, if, I think I'm right, Derek, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure we made our first contact um, via Instagram or Twitter or, you know, we were talking about the book and he said he was interested and, and, it, and it went from there. So, oh, wow. you know, we've, we've been so lucky to find people who've really supported us, but it, it has meant that this kind of a book, it, you know, has a, has a life, which is it's wonderful. It's a classic that should be part of every wine lover's um, library, not just those who are studying perhaps for a certification, but anyone who loves uh, Bordeaux wine. It's just beautiful. Tell us about the maps. There's 65 of them and I'm, we're looking at one right now. You call it gatefold or uh, sort of a ladder yeah. fold out. What's unique about that? So these maps, so this is something I haven't mentioned so far. I was incredibly lucky to find and BB and our press, so and Chris and Carrie. But the other thing that I was lucky about was that I got to write this book with a scientific advisor who's called Professor Kays van Leeuwen, and he or Kays van Leeuwen, and he is um, a, a Dutch professor here who has lived in Bordeaux for I think longer than I have. I think probably twenty five years or thirty years, and he's a, a terroir expert. And I, I did a, you said right at the beginning of your intro that I had done a course at the Institute of Enology here, the Institute of Science of Vine, Wine and Vine. And he was one of my professors. Mm. I'd also known him as a journalist because he used to um, be kind of the technical director of Chateau Cheval Blanc. And he did a lot. So I'd, so I'd met him before he was my teacher. But as soon as he was my teacher, I really had my eyes open to how brilliant he is because he has the ability to talk about things like terroir and soils and these concepts which could be a little bit boring or a little bit complicated and certainly you know difficult for us to connect with emotionally and he had this ability to make everything seem so fascinating and clear and it was during one of his lectures which was now probably 10 years ago that I first thought oh my god why is nobody talking about Bordeaux in this way and I know that I can help wine people, wine lovers, get excited about Bordeaux again by just starting to see it in a different way. And that is by going a little bit underground and mm. approaching Bordeaux in the way we approach Burgundy without even thinking about it. We talk about terroir and Burgundy and we kind of don't here. So, so anyway, Kays and I had discussed writing a book together off and on. We did, we'd had discussions about it. But then when I met Chris and Carrie, I knew that I had to go back to Kays and say, please, will you, will you be the scientific advisor? And thank God he said yes. <laughs> so, so the maps have come from that, from his brilliance. But what we did and why they're so unusual is that we looked, we basically did a stock take of all of the maps that were out there about Bordeaux and that had been put together over the last couple of decades. And you had various maps by different people Sometimes they might have been geologists, sometimes they were soil scientists, whatever. So they were all coming from different angles. Some of them were at very small scale, some were huge scale. Some had actually been published. Some were just sat in the drawers of various um, professors. And so what we did was we brought all of those together. And then Kay's, either he'd done them originally or he worked with the people who had, or, and we redid them so that they're standard. So this really mm. is new material that has been brought together, overseen by Kays or and other, other people as well, but every single time he has made sure that the colors are the same, the scale is the same, so it can, so it makes sense for people who's, who are reading it. Hmm. And there are a couple like um, Fronzac, Montan, Santamillion, um, and up in the northern part of the Medoc that we've redone just for this book. So, wow. so they are completely new um, research. And where we don't have them, if there's any places that are missed, it's because it doesn't exist and we, we, will, we will do it for the next time. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, this really is super, super exciting. And it's why this book has worked for so many different people. Um, I, I, I have had, at the end of last year, probably the most satisfying week in terms of reviews. This was given Book of the Year by the Irish Sun, which wow. is... Wow. Uh, just a you know a, a normal tabloid type thing in Ireland and at the same time the Times Literary Supplement in one week both of them gave this book one of their book of the year and oh my I goodness just not that, just wine book of the year but book of the year category yeah one of the and it just 
made yeah. me just think it's so cool that we've managed to hit those different target yeah. audiences because the bits which I write I really hope I make it kind of fun and clear as much as possible and a lot about human stories <laughs> but then there's also a, this really quite in-depth scientific adding to the conversation about Bordeaux and adding to what people know about Bordeaux through genuine research so mm -hmm. you know that was really very satisfying for Kays and for me to, to get that reaction. Fantastic. And now these maps, not only do they fold out, making them easier to read, you don't have to get to totally microscopic, especially uh, for people of a certain age, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you've done something really interesting. So on one side, we see the, the maps and the soils. What's uh, on the flip side of some of these maps? Yeah, so in fact, let's look at the picture that's up in front of us right now. So yes. on the left-hand side, of, of that gatefold, we have kind of a classic, it's in green, you can see the river and this is basically your classic look at the Appalachians and in each one of that you will see the names of the chateaus, you've got little um, points that show you where the chateau is, okay. but then on the other side, on the right hand side, the, the, your, the different colours you're seeing here are different terraces, gravel terraces, <gasps> so, so the Medoc is made up of six different gravel terraces, they're T1 to T6 and I tell you in the book, um, you know what, what what is what does that mean what's the difference between these terraces and one of the crazy things when you start to look is that of the 1855 classified estates they are all bar none on terrace three or terrace four oh, and wow. it's really incredible yeah. and so what you can do here is you can look and see the name of the chateau on the left hand side and then you can flip over and see where what kind of soil is it on on the right, right hand side and through the book, I kind of try and tell you as much as possible. Of course, of course, it's complicated. And I'm only, you know, there's always an exception to things. But I try and say to you, if you're, if the chateau is on this type of soil, this is what it will taste like in this kind of a vintage. So if it's a dry vintage, look for wines on limestone, because they will keep their freshness more than a wine that's on a very, very dry gravelly soil that might get too hot. You know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Sure. So you're getting back to the real dirt, the real stories, the real people. And it's it's kind of neat. To, it is the sort of underground history. It's like, let's look below the layers because we think only of these grand chateau. I call it castle marketing. Um, but yeah, there's so right. much going on underneath here. And, and you've shown it so beautifully with all of these maps. So... Um, Absolutely. Let me just, oh, there you are. That's in your home, right? <laughs> that is in my home. That's on the other <laughs> side of this. Uh, <laughs> okay, there you go. I love that. <laughs> very, very relaxed and casual about Bordeaux. <laughs> That's great. All right. So cool. Let's, um, let's come back to this. Now, I wanted to hear more of those stories that um, you had in the book. There was somebody who was wow. Oh, I know what you were getting at. You're, now you've talked about how wine methods, um, wine making methods have changed due to climate change, but there's also been a lot of uh, invigoration in wine making techniques. Um, like you mentioned ecoforestry and uh, biodiversity, a lot of big initiatives. What's, what are those about and how, how's that happening in Bordeaux? So because Bordeaux is such a big region and makes so much wine, it can also be the poster child for a lot of the bad stuff about mm -hmm. wine. So I would say probably five years ago or so, there was a, a big expose on French TV about the amount of chemicals that were being used in Bordeaux winemaking, in traditional mm -hmm. Bordeaux winemaking. It was slightly unfair because they were measuring the overall amount of chemicals across the whole region. And this is a much bigger region than most other regions. So in that way, they were unfairly pointing out what was happening in Bordeaux. But that's not to say that they didn't need to make huge improvements. They definitely did. And over the last decade, and particularly over the last five years, what you're starting to see is not just estates moving towards organic and biodynamic, which is happening. It's about 10% of the region today is organic or biodynamic certified. Um, but you're also seeing bigger, wider projects. So um, the appellation of Santa Million, for example, as of next year, I think next year, um, or maybe 2020. Three, if you want to have the name Santa Million on your label, you must be making your wine under some green initiative. So you must either be organic or biodynamic, or you must be, um, there's a thing called um, HVE, which is an environmental certification, or you must be, you know, they, they've, they've got a list of about 10 different things that you can choose to be. But if you're not doing that, you can no longer call yourself Santa Million. So that's wow. a great initiative. Yeah. And then the appellation of Margot, 
they have huge biodiversity programs, which about 70% of the Appalachian has signed up to. And, and there you have to do things like planting hedgerows, making sure that you have um, places for birds to, to nest or there's, there's, everyone's making honey now in Bordeaux. It's like a new, <laughs> it's like the big thing. Um, <laughs> because that encourages the bees and the, which in turn encourages exactly. other Keeps this good biodiversity things. going, yes. exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so agroforestry is something else where either it's happening within their estates or there's a few properties who, who, are, who are planting in the centre of France in compensation for what for what's happening in terms of vines. So people are just starting to kind of open their minds a bit more and be a bit more aware because the, the downside of Bordeaux unquestionably is it's almost a monoculture in terms of the, the, the vines. The vines are everywhere here. And if you look right back again in the archives, one of the things that I just love so much about, about the history is if you look at Poyac, Poyac today is you know, one of the most famous Appalachians in the world, really um, makes all these wonderful wines. Three out of the five first growths come from Poyac. The real planting happened in Poyac between 1700 and 1750. Before that, there were mixed use farms. So people had a bit of vines, but they were doing other things as well. But, but in the early 18th century, suddenly people realized you could make a lot of money planting vines. And because the people who owned the land didn't live here, they were wealthy, they lived in Paris or they lived in Bordeaux or wherever, but they weren't the people who were actually trying to live off that land. So they just planted vines everywhere to the point that everybody was starving because you couldn't at that time, you know, you had to be growing locally. You couldn't pop down to the shop and buy whatever. Everything was what, what you were making yourself. So one of the problems that they think had happened by the French Revolution was that in this part of France, in, in the Medoc, there were so much vines, so many vines planted that people were genuinely having problem getting any other food. And so it was creating all of this unrest. So even, you know, you look back in history, the problem of monocult monoculture has always been a problem, even if it's not to do with the environment. So that's um, quite quite neat. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah, but what's happening today is, is that people are being much more aware, plant some other trees among the vineyards or make sure that you've got, there's a, there's a, a lovely estate here called Chateau Le Puy, which is in on the right bank. And they say for every single hectare of vines that they plant, they'll have a hectare of wild, wild flowers or a hectare of, of forest or something else. Fantastic. That mindset is pervasive. You have another, um, you chronicle another uh, winery. Is it Le Fleur de Cardinal does something with their crates that they sell oh, the wine yeah. in? Yeah. Yes? So they've just this year, um, Chateau La Fleur Cardinal, exactly. Yeah, in Saint Emilion. And so at the, on the base of their um, wooden crate, when you buy the wine, they have um, like an instruction, uh, um, instructions on how to turn it into a a box for um for birds how to turn it into a bird box and they're going to do it as a competition each year where anyone who's a consumer can write in with ideas for how to recycle the box and they That's will great. and they'll print the best one on the bottom of the of the wine box each year which I is love very that cool. idea that's creative that is great um so for those of us who are hunting for bargains so there's quite a diversity we're understanding now but where should we be looking what regions and or vintages are are going to offer us the most value so the great thing about the fact that Bordeaux is led by vintages is that if you find a vintage which is less media kind of championed then you're, used, you're likely to find better prices. Um, and again, one of the things I'm really try to do in the book, because I want to be as consumer led as possible, is try to say, there's no such thing as a good or bad vintage. You know, there's always places that do well and places that do less well. And also my suggestion would be to think of it, is this a vintage to wait for a long time? Or is this a vintage where you can drink it sooner? So there's years like 2007, for example. 2007 wasn't so media friendly over the last decade. People have not really talked about it, but it's tasting really delicious right now it's because it isn't a vintage to put away for 500 years, for 50 years, whatever. It's a vintage to drink. And now a lot of those wines are ready to drink. The, the, I'm talking of the bigger estates, um, the, the classified estates. And so 2007 is a great place to look right now. Um, <laughs> Years like 2011, again, tasting delicious now, but people don't really think about them in the it, and, and you'll always find slightly lower prices. So, hmm. and then even in big, great years. So if you think of 2010, 
or yes. 2016, both years which everybody said were brilliant, and they are, but they were very expensive. That's when I would suggest you go to look at places like Fronzac or La Londe de Pomerol or these smaller appellations, because everywhere did well in those kind of vintages. So you don't have mm. to spend the money necessarily to go to the, to the big estates unless you're wanting to do it as an investment and keep it for decades. But most of us, that's not why we're buying wine. That's true. And I love how you've um, written before, just, you know, go over the hill or across the stream, just outside the big marquee names, like instead of saint Emilion, is it Montagne de Saint-Emilion, yeah, something yeah. like that, or, yeah. or the Coates? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that's yeah. where you'll often find so, so for, for example, that's a great example. There's a coat called Castillon and another one called Franck, Frank Coat de Bordeaux. And both of them are over 50% organic or biodynamic. They're oh. really the centers of, of green winemaking. And there's so many delicious wines. And particularly because now we're having warmer and drier summers nearly every year, limestone is absolutely coming into its own right now. And those places, Castillon and Cote de Franc or Franc Cote de Bordeaux, they have a lot of limestone. So they do great in hot summers. And, and, and that's expensive. because they have a lot of acidity. Is it, is it yeah, the drainage? Keep, is that exactly. what it is? They, they keep, they monitor, basically any terroir is good if it monitors, if it controls water supply. That's okay. really what, it, that's why it can be great on clay. It can be great on gravel. It can be great on limestone. It's all about how it, how it supplies the water to the vines at the right moment in the growing season. And in a hot year, limestone is great because it's, it, where people say it's like a sponge, but it's true. It, it, it holds water, and the, and the, but it's not, it's not too waterlogged and right. it will kind of let the vines get the water when they need it. And it keeps freshness. It keeps oh. acidity, as you say. Oh, that's great. And so are you optimistic about Bordeaux's future, Jane? Yes, I, I do think that, um, we will probably will see changes. And I think in 50 years, you know, well, it'll be interesting to see how, how it changes. I think that Bordeaux is adaptable and they have the money, which is important. They have the money to be able to um, invest in research to how to adapt. I think that what we're seeing now, we talked about viticulture, you know, different things like the, the, all kinds of rootstocks, um, how high they're training the vines, all, all kinds of things different um, grape varieties that they can introduce that are still within the traditional grapes of Bordeaux, but, but in different um, blends, different percentages. But I definitely think that parts of Bordeaux, which have been discounted before for not getting ripe enough, will become more and more important. So like Castillon, like Cote de Franc, like Fronzac, and like the northern part of the Medoc, which for years people said, oh, rustic tannins never get ripe enough, lots of, um, you know, um, the green notes because they just don't get ripe. I think we're going to really start to see that they make some great wines in the coming decades. Well, that's good news for consumers. Oh yeah. my gosh, what an amazing conversation. I, I could go on for hours, but <laughs> I know you have a life, Jane. Um, <laughs> but uh, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to mention uh, now as we wrap up? Um, no, just, just that um, I have come here as an, as an outsider. I know I'm, I'm not, now I love Bordeaux, but I didn't come here thinking I was going to fall in love with Bordeaux. And I... I definitely one of the things that I've loved about writing this book and doing the research is just feeling kind of enthused again at just how much there is happening here, which people don't talk about it and don't know. So that that's that's very that's very fun. Absolutely. Hold up your book again, please. And I just want to remind people as we're looking at this gorgeous book, you could win a signed copy or you can just go and buy yourself one from All the Right Grapes. Or is there a central website where you list all yeah, distributors around the world? Um, okay. So um, BBR.com, so okay. the Berry Brothers website um, yeah. in London. On yeah. that website, they have all the different distributors around the world. Okay, perfect. Because we do have an audience outside of Canada as well. So they'll want to know where to, to get this. But uh, yeah, oh. so... I really um, appreciate so much you asking me on and taking the time. Thank oh, you. Oh, absolutely, Jane. You are a delight. And I've learned so much about Bordeaux. I'm enthused. Like I, I'm ready to get, dig back into Bordeaux and, and 
I want to, I want to, I'm going to get your book too. Um, and just do a tasting and then go to the maps. And, and I want to see what layers, what layers am I drinking? Literally, <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> All right, uh, Jane. So we will say uh, goodbye for now, but um, good luck with your future projects and let's stay in touch. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I can't wait to come to Canada and to do some tastings with you. It would be wonderful. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.